Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening from far and wide. My name is Jen Shin, and I am one of the organizers of this year's J. Irwin Miller Symposium. I'd like to virtually welcome you all back to the Yale School of Architecture and this inaugural Yale Mental Health Symposium titled Beyond the Visible, Space, Place, and Power in Mental Health. This evening brings to us our third event and second panel session, The Home. Two days ago during the hospital panel, our guest Kalechi Ubozo spoke about the importance of connectivity, safety, and creating spaces for healing that feel like home. Tonight, with heightened importance in light of the global pandemic, we'd like to dive deeper into the primacy of home and improving mental health outcomes. With a historic decline of institutional asylums and inpatient mental care, we are witnessing a rise in community-based home care. But underserved populations with mental illness continue to face barriers to good, affordable, or sheltered housing. Racist urban malpractices and policies, such as redlining, have shaped a culture of race-based housing discrimination. Unequal access to secure housing, along with other social determinants of health, contribute to cascading and deleterious impacts on the health of Black, Indigenous, and people of color who suffer from mental illness. The spotlight turns onto designers and design professionals to examine the ways design is enmeshed in housing inequality. Tonight, we are invited to listen and learn from experts in health and housing as we consider new methods of shaping housing to better serve our communities. A now beloved call to action presented by Mindy Thompson Foley Love last week was to turn on the love. Let us continue to turn on the love tonight as we redress perceptions of mental health at the most basic scale of the home and examine the importance of home in improving mental health outcomes for both individuals and society at large. During the panel today, please post your questions in the Q&A box and like the ones you wanna be posed to the panelists. At the end of the panel, we will unmute guests to ask their questions directly to the panel. Our discussion tonight will be led by our fantastic moderator, Jessica Helfand. Jessica received her BA and MFA from Yale University, where she taught for more than two decades. She has held visiting professorships at the Cooper Union, Wesleyan University, and Paris College of Art. She is a co-founder of Design Observer and co-host of two podcasts, The Observatory and The Design of Business, The Business of Design. She is the author of numerous books on design and visual culture, including Design, The, Inven the Invention of Desire, Face, A Visual Odyssey, and the forthcoming Self-Reliance, Thoughts for a New World. In 2019, Jessica was named the first Henry Wolf resident in design at the American Academy in Rome. She is also a life fellow at the American Antiquarian Society, a member of the Alliance Graphique Internationale, and a 2013 recipient of the AIGA Medal. A former member of the U.S. Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee, she has held fellowships at the Civitelli Ranieri Foundation, the Bogliasco Foundation, and Caltech. I'd like to also take this time to thank Jessica for serving as an advisor to this symposium. Jessica's laser sharp focus and generous mentorship has provided this team the courage and support needed to organize these events. Thank you, Jessica, for your guidance. Everyone at home, please give a warm welcome to this evening's moderator, Jessica Helfand. Thank you, Jen. Thank you to all of you for making this evening possible and this event possible. To Dean Burke and the faculty at the School of Architecture and to you and Kate and all the hardworking students who are so well organized. It gives us hope at a moment when we may not have a lot of hope. Uh, I want to begin this evening with a small adjustment, which is that one of our panelists, Alison Cunningham, had a last minute conflict and won't be joining us tonight. But I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge her work and how seminal her work has been uh, for so many people working in this field, and I think certainly instrumental in the evolution of this topic tonight. For those of you who don't know, Alison Cunningham led Columbus House here in New Haven, where her work was instrumental in many ways, not least of which was housing thousands and thousands of people uh, during the 21 years of her reign as CEO. She couldn't be here tonight, but I wanted to share, begin with a little piece of her wisdom. 
uh, that might bring us together for a moment. This is something she said a few years ago uh, when she was receiving an award, which is, was her way of acknowledging, I think, the deeply human necessity of what it means to do right by others. And she framed this in terms of leadership. Leaders, Allison said, are not called to be popular, not called to be safe, not called to follow. We are the ones called to take risks. We are the ones called to change attitudes, to risk displeasure. We are the ones called to gamble our lives for a better world. None of the things you're going to hear tonight are easy to talk about. None of this work is easy, but all of it is deeply necessary. Our topic tonight is home, but our focus for a good part of the next 90 minutes will be on what happens when our homes are taken from us. Some of you, architects perhaps, may hear the word home and picture walls or a roof, privacy, comfort. But for those challenged with access to financial, political, cultural, nutritional, and perhaps most pressingly for our purposes tonight, mental health support, these comforts are neither implicit nor in any way secure. Home, let's just start with this, is a privilege. And the people you're going to hear from tonight have made it their life's work to extend that privilege to everyone. As we log in this evening from remote, remote corners of the globe, I wanna begin this conversation by framing it a little more widely and asking us to think about the very basic question of shelter, which is both a universal human right and a universal human problem. In Greece last week, thousands of migrants were left homeless after fires gutted a refugee camp on the Isle of Lesbos. This past weekend in Nepal, dozens lost their homes in a landslide. And as of today, the fires gutting the Western regions of the United States have left more than 150,000 people homeless. So let's look at this word shelter for a moment. It's a verb, it's a noun. It's a word that originates in the 16th century, comes from the word shield, and initially was described as a structure, including some degree of protection. Just chew on that for a moment. Shelter as protection. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that shelter was introduced into contemporary usage when a pamphlet distributed by the Salvation Army used it to mean lodging for the homeless poor. That was in 1895. I recently read a study from 2014, quite a bit more recently, that suggested depending on the age group in question and how homelessness itself is defined, Approximately 25% of those homeless in America, some 140,000 people, are defined at any given point as suffering from mental illness. So this is the work. The American actress Glenn Close once said that mental health, what mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversation. Architects may be able to help with the sunlight, and my panelists tonight will take care of the rest. My first panelist, Sam Sumbaris, is a clinical community psychologist who founded the Housing First program in 1992, an evidence-based practice that results in significantly better housing stability and improved quality of life for individuals experiencing homelessness and severe mental health, addiction, and health problems. He currently serves as CEO of the Pathways Housing First Institute and executive director of the VA UCLA Center for Excellence in Training and Research in Veteran Homelessness. Sam is the recipient of a gold award for community mental health programs from the American Psychiatric Association, a distinguished contribution to independent practice from the American Psychological Association, and a meritorious service cross from the Lieutenant Governor of Canada. Earl Chambers is Director of the Division of Research in the Department of Family and Social Medicine at Albert Einstein Medicine, uh, College of Medicine, forgive me, in the Bronx, where he is an Associate Professor of Family and Social Medicine and of Epidemiology and Population Health, as well as a member of the leadership team for the New York Regional Center for Diabetes Translation Research. He received a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Duke, a Master's in Public Health from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and a PhD in epidemiology with a concentration on chronic disease from the University of Pittsburgh, 
before going on to complete a postdoc at the New York Obesity Nutrition Center at Columbia. Dr. Chambers has received grants from the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the John, T. And John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation for studies on how social determinants of health, such as housing and neighborhood conditions, affect behaviors and health outcomes for patients, both as individuals and part of larger communities. So welcome, Earl and Sam. And I think we want Sam to turn his camera on, correct? Yes, there he is. Hi, Sam. Hi, welcome. good to be with you. Thank you. I want to come back to this this word shelter, which I think is a is a important one for you and for for those of us who are not in your world of mental health advocacy. Uh, and I, I found this quote from the American architect Philip Johnson, who once said that all architecture is shelter. All great architecture, as I said, is the design of space that contains, cuddles, exalts, or stimulates the persons in that space. I know you're all shocked by the fact that Philip Johnson used the word cuddle in a, in a definition of architectural greatness, but let's just continue. So I want to start, Sam, by asking you to share with us a little bit of your experience, because I think your, your work talks about a different kind of stimulation on a very individual, complex level, the unwanted kind of stimulation, and what it means to consider, consider the sensitive nature of, of what it means to work for someone for whom home is a very unstable content, con concept because shelter itself might not be that easy to come by. Well, you know, there's a range of homelessness and it does include people who are literally living on the street and also people who are in shelter, quote unquote, shelter. And shelters have a tremendous range in themselves from sort of um, organizations run by uh, volunteer groups or religious groups to mega shelters that are run by municipal governments and have hundreds of cots. And so this, uh, there's, there's, a, there's an industry to homelessness that incorporates the word shelter. And of course, in the variations in size, there's also a variation in quality of care and welcoming so that you might have a shelter that is uh, uh, accepting, come as you are from the street, we'll take care of you, we'll give you a meal, we'll give you a bed for the night. And you have other shelters that are quite um, strict in their invitational exclusionary criteria. You can come to us, but come sober. Come only at this time and leave at this time. Um, and when you're here, make sure you meet with the case manager so that there's quite a prescriptive uh, program within the shelters and, and those also vary. One of the things about the homelessness industry, if you will, is that there are so many more homeless people than there are programs for them that every one of these shelters that I'm describing, small or large, kind and welcoming or strict and punitive, if you will, are all filled to capacity because there are so many people in desperate need that there are enough people to make it seem like every shelter is doing good work because they have so many clients. And, and if capacity and level of service is a measure of success, then it's hard to differentiate what success really means. Talk to us a little bit about this idea of how you define program. Program is a word architects use uh, in maybe not so dissimilar a way. And, and I wonder if there's something about the programmatic, programmatic outreach of taking the huge problem of homelessness and yeah. breaking it down into smaller pieces, where have you found that there are interventions in spatial conditions of welcoming that don't require moving in full time? Right. So. One of the things that is uh, maybe not so familiar to people is that people who have been homeless, especially for a while, uh, and that means you know the people that we typically see on the street, even though the people that we see on the street are only about 15% of the entire homeless population, most people are in abandoned buildings or in shelters or in cars, but that group becomes the public image of homelessness and they most services are designed for them. One of the things that we have understood is that the people who are 
homeless know a great deal about the homeless service system. And so the public often says, oh, there are so many programs. Why is this person out there? They're, they must be choosing to be homeless. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, you know, that was actually a quote that we have on several videos from Ronald Reagan's time, which is in America, you know, homeless was created under Reagan. That's really supply side economics and trickle down theory create, and taking money out of public housing created homelessness part one, and then part two, the real estate market went through the roof because everyone's building these beautiful houses that no one on fixed income, people with mental illness can afford. So homelessness is just this, you know, and people under 30 don't really appreciate that homelessness has not been a part of the American landscape forever. But for these people who are homeless and on the street, they know what place they want to go to or not, or to avoid so they're not homeless by choice. They're, they're making smart choices given their temperament. They can't tolerate a shelter that's, that's brutally, um, uh, you know, that closes at five or requires them to be sober. They need to drink a beer before they go to sleep. That, that's not going to work for them. Uh, and they can't go to a shelter where they have to pray because that's not their faith, you know. So they're, they're, choosing, they're choosing an alternative but it's not a reluctance to be helped. It's that they want to be helped in their own way. And this to me speaks to, you know, a couple of themes in this conference, which I love, are the invisibility of the things that affect decision-making and also power. This is a power issue. And most homeless services are defined by the decision-making power of the provider, the person, accessing the services has almost no influence in how the program will look. The one thing that we did different, I think, is that we began to listen to people who were homeless and designed a program, to use your word, that was designed by the person that was going to use it. You know, uh, that was uh, the reason for the success of our program. It's been quite successful in terms of engaging people is that it is all driven by the design of the client. So uh, it was almost like having a focus group for a cons you know, consumer group and they said, this is what we want and this is what we don't want and we, we made the program. Empirically, in all the years you've been doing this work, given how individual the descriptions you give about what, what the sort of taste and need and human desire is around these objectives, I hate to ask this question because it's a terrible word, but I'm wondering, do these things scale? Like, how do you scale something that's so individual, but at a systemic level has yes. to work economically and becomes a, a, something that we can all learn from and make it better for all of these people that we can't even see? You, you, the numbers right. you give are tremendous. Right. It wasn't uh, easy, but fortunately, I can tell you that there are today, you know, 25 years after we started bringing one person at a time to an apartment of their own in the community. That was the, that was the first choice. It was like, you want to go to this beautifully new constructed building with 20 other people who were formerly homeless and live in the here? No, thanks. You know, I, I don't want to be identified as mentally ill. I want to live like everybody else. I don't want to live with social workers. I want to live in a house and maybe go talk to a social worker, but they wanted the separation of housing and treatment most housing built for people with mental illness is still, I would call it like boutique, boutique institutions, 20, 30 beds, maybe even a hundred beds, some of them, but all identified as very programmatic. The people we were dealing with wanted a place of their own in the community like everybody else. And then of course, they had severe mental illness or they were struggling with addiction or health problems or they needed other assistance so the program's other component, besides renting an apartment in the community, was to have people doing home visits. So yes, very individualized, person by person. And the way I know it can be scaled is that you can have big programs, but that's not scale. There are countries right now, Finland, Norway, uh, Denmark, particularly because they have, they have a, 
a social contract that's different than ours. It's not individually based, it's collectively based. The tax sharing system is very different than it is here. And also there's a commitment to community in a way that we don't have. Plus they have healthcare as a right, housing as a right, not a privilege, as a right, education, employment. So the values piece is huge. Finland has ended homelessness using this housing first model. And our housing first model, by the way, was not defined by us. People gave people choice and what they wanted first was housing. What they wanted first was housing. Not shelter, not a temporary place, not treatment, but housing first because that created the kind of stability that would allow for other things. Finland in the last 10 years has built if there's one message I want all of these architects to hear is like Finland's got the perfect model. It's a mixed income model. It's regular housing, affordable housing in the community, apartment buildings. But what they do is they set aside 10, 20, 30% of the units for people that are of different means. Some people can afford to pay the full rent. Others pay their benefits, you know, or some subsidized version of it. But together, the whole portfolio is financially sustainable because there are enough payers to cover those that aren't paying the full price. What you have there is economic sustainability, and you have a community that includes people with mental illness in the community in regular housing like everyone else. So you're not building boutique housing for the homeless or the mentally ill. You're building housing because that's what everybody needs. We have spent centuries from institutions to today thinking, what is the right design for people with mental illness? Oh, let's see, maybe a kitchen, a bedroom, you know, a bathroom. How about that? Oh, it sounds like everybody else's place. The housing is the same for everyone, but the level of support is what makes the housing supported. It's not in the architecture of the unit, it's in the architecture of the support services. Right. It's the infrastructure. It's the, it's the, yes. it, the, and the social services and the integration, it would seem to me, yes. uh, and, the, yes. and the organization of that. Um, yeah. I want to dig down a little deeper into you and your background. The Washington Post described you once as the man who has all but solved chronic homelessness. Uh, there was an article about you in 2015 in the Washington Post in which you self-identify as a clinician, yet your colleagues expressed surprise that you cared so much about housing aesthetics. And it was revealed that the data overwhelmingly supported that this mattered. Can you talk about what this and, and maybe take us a little bit through how you came to discover this uh, was actually a factor? Well, it, it was a factor immediately because uh, when we were on the street working with people and engaging them as clinicians, uh, you wanna go to the hospital, your feet are swollen, there's pus coming out of your sneaker, can we help you? So yes, you know, maybe go to the hospital. But what happened afterward, we had very few options. People did not want the shelter, not comfortable there, especially for people with mental illness. The shelters in New York City, where I was working at the time, were huge. You know, there was a Fort Washington shelter that had a thousand beds in it. You know, it's like, it was chaos. And a lot of people in kind of a desperate emotional state. So for those that are most vulnerable, people with mental illness, the shelter didn't feel safe. Uh, do you want to go to a program? Yes, but the programs required 12 months of sobriety, you know, six months of compliance with psychiatric treatment because they wanted people to be stable before they were housed. It's like, well, no, it probably what they wanted was a place of their own first. And we really, we had to start a new nonprofit agency with a grant from the State Office of Mental Health to provide services in the way that the consumer wanted, in the way the clients wanted it, because nothing like that existed before. Take someone right from the street with their plastic bags and their other gear and move them right into an apartment. And it's like, is this going to work? I, I don't know, but it's the only thing that people wanted. They wanted a place that was their own, safe, secure, dignified, and integrated into the community. The thing that we found was it worked spectacularly well because even though on a quick walk by the person seemed so helpless, that very same person was negotiating where to get the food pantry, 
where they have a post office box to collect their monthly check, where it's safe to sleep, how to manage an entire life with nothing. So of course, bringing that person to an apartment that they have the skills and the resilience to manage a life on the inside. When we did randomized controlled trials, offering people from the street housing right away with supports versus let's try getting you sober and stable before housing, we had an 80% success rate with housing first and a 40% success rate with treatment and then housing. And that kind of research has been replicated in Canada. They did a national study in five cities, 2,000 people randomly assigned. France, same way nationally. I would say in general, the Europeans are much more ahead of the Americans on this because of the values piece, you know, community, safety net, creates fewer people who are homeless and also a greater commitment to help those who are homeless. You know, the larger the income disparity in any nation, any nation across the globe, the greater the number of homeless people. Direct correlation. It's a shocking statistic and it's one, I'd like to bring in our second panelist, Earl, if we could get you to turn your camera on, my friend, it would be great. Um, this question of uh, that you just raised about uh, our vulnerable, our most vulnerable populations. I think this is a question I want to take to you. Uh, a study of, uh, and, and in particular about what it means to be vulnerable uh, in communities where widespread segregation has deepened housing inequities uh, among people. In, in, in um, certainly, I think in the work that you're doing, you can tell us more about this. Much of your work is about this. It's about the about health equity. Talk to us a little bit, if you would, Earl, about housing insecurity and its relationship to mental health and, and, and how this, excuse me, how, how you're seeing this in your work in terms of these racial and economic disparities in the community in which you're working. Sure. So, um, I mean, thanks for, thanks for having me and, and uh, I appreciate being able to be here. I, I find this to be like very informative for me. Um, to answer your question, you know, um, when you think about just housing and housing insecurity in general, and we think about um, you know, who our most vulnerable um, people are, you know, there tends to be sort of um, like racial sort of disparities with respect to that. So our black and brown communities tend to be more at risk um, when we're talking about homelessness or even housing insecurity in general. So um, and there's a long history of, of the reasons for that. And so you mentioned sort of um, the different policies that influence residential segregation. Um, redlining is a common one that people talk about, but there are others. And just thinking about how people have access to resources and how they get to be housed in certain conditions versus others is important to understand. So for me, I'm, I'm at the intersection of kind of um, you know, population health and primary care because I work in a clinical department. And for us, the, um, you know, a lot of what Sam was talking about on identifying our homeless population and trying to, to connect them to the resources is important to do. But we're also seeing that um, you know, we have a significant portion of our population that you know, have different levels of housing insecurity and trying to, to better identify that. You know, that's something that, um, that I've been working closely to try and do more recently. So it's, uh, it's about trying to figure out what are, the, what are the drivers to health and understanding you know, how these kind of social conditions influence um, people's ability to either prioritize healthy behaviors um, or, or to make sort of better, better um, or different choices with respect to their health. So understanding that context where people live and they live within communities, within neighborhoods, and then the influences that, does that, that um, allow them to have access to, to, um, to overall sort of like resources for wellness. So that's what, so Anyone who has lived through the last six months and understands what it means to not be able to hug somebody you love, uh, understands the relationship between public health. What is good for public health is not necessarily good for anyone's mental health right now. But when you talk about population health, you're taking that and amplifying it to understand how these conditions actually grow. And what is the actual work? Is it, because you're a clinician, right? You're actually seeing people, you're, you're doing the work that Sam does actually like on the street I'm, talking to people. I'm a, I'm a population scientist, so I'm not a clinician, but I work in the clinical department. So I'm an epidemiologist by training. I look at, I look at the patterns of health in populations. So, but within the clinical department that I work within, because we are all sort of oriented around the social determinants of health, um, the interaction between clinical care 
and the populations that our patients live in is the important intersection for me. So when I think what, about housing, sorry, go ahead. No, that's exactly where I was going to go. So tell us, how does that intersect with, with the question of home? Right. So when I think about, when I, when I examine sort of what are the characteristics of housing and housing insecurity that influence health outcomes? So whether you're talking about the quality of the housing, whether you're talking about the stability of the housing, like the affordability of it, and what are the different sort of characteristics that influence health outcomes or health behaviors. And so part of what we do within the clinical space though, is starting to, to better identify what those kind of like housing, uh, which of our patients have those kinds of housing challenges. So that is the, that's the connection. So typically within the clinical space, we don't, we don't systematically measure those things. You know, we don't, we don't measure like, so do you feel like you're um, at risk for losing your home in the next two months? You know, do you feel like that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue for you? But we know um, that it's very difficult to manage people's health when they have those kinds of, um, you know, housing stability issues, right? So as, as an example, if, you, if you're trying to manage a chronic condition like, um, like diabetes or even, or even just like, um, you know, um, we want them to prioritize certain healthier behaviors, it's very difficult to do that when, you know, you are paying, you know, an, an, a very high amount of rent where you don't have like the resources to really do much of anything else. So understanding the context that people live in is the important thing. And then looking at patterns of certain kinds of people who have or coming with, um, with less options than others. So if we agree as a society that everyone deserves to live in a place where they have access to resources for well-being, then we have to sort of pay attention to some of these disparities and then figure out ways to address those. Uh, as someone who, so talk, let's talk about these disparities. Black people, you recently wrote, make up 40% of the homeless population, but only represent 13% of the general U.S. population. So your work, you're looking nationwide at these statistics. This is, that's nationwide statistics, yeah. And really looking at sort of the disproportionate um, amount of homelessness in, in sort of our Black communities. And are you, are you, is there more of that in urban centers? Is it, are there regional challenges that you pay attention to in your studies? I mean, typically, if you, um, you know, certain urban centers are having more issues with homelessness, uh, but, but it's, it's, a, it's the statistics I'm talking about are general across the United States. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really looking at, yes, homelessness is an issue, but it's burdening some of our population more than others. And so just trying to figure out if whatever the solutions are that we're addressing that particular disparity. What solutions are you finding? Are you finding any solutions? Well, that's, I, that's part of why we're here. I mean, there, there are other options too. So if you think about kind of the, the, um, the issues around access to resources is one. So what we know is that if you have a constant, if you concentrate pe in people in low poverty areas where, I mean, in high poverty areas where there's limited access to resources, then, you know, it's very difficult to um, have anything other than sort of poor health outcomes. So what we need to do is, is um, have one affordable housing so that people have the ability to not be paying quite so much in their, um, in their rent or mortgages to be able to afford other things in their life. And also to allow them access to neighborhoods that have other options. So, I mean, that's, and that could be anything from, um, you know, um, allowing there to be more low income housing in neighborhoods of opportunity you know, um, to a public investment in the kind of things where we are supporting, um, you know, low income housing, like public housing or using like housing vouchers and those kind of things. So there, there, are, there are ways to sort of address the issues of access, but, you know, we just have to kind of work on those things. And those are far upstream. But the way that right. I think about it, it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of all hands on deck. So for me, it's like, yes, we have immediate needs around housing security and we address those. But then there are also issues around, you know, making sure that communities have access to wellness and access to resources for wellness. And then looking at larger issues around, well, what is our kind of like societal contribution to address this issue? How right. So, so some of that's got to be at a policy level, all right? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, Sam yeah. talked about this a minute ago, and we're going to come back together with both of you and talk about this. But to the degree that resources are about access, but you're talking about food insecurity, you're talking about education. I'm, I'm very curious if you, uh, are you finding yourself in a similar uh, place where, where your efforts are uh, rewarded by talking to your patients individually and asking what they want? Is some of the research actually doing hands-on 
dialogue with the people who, who are your constituents? So the, all of the above, yes. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, I, I guess I should, you know, coming to this place of, of trying to understand housing and health was not where I started. So, you know, initially it's kind of, well, you know, we're at an individual level of health and, you know, you're having issues or having problems, you know, how can we better understand that on an individual level? But then what we're finding is that, you know, these kind of social determinants of health, those things that are far upstream, are really uh, important for us to understand, you know, how people are able to prioritize those health behaviors. So, start, so I started looking at those kinds of things and looking more at housing as a fundamental, um, you know, social determinant of health in my mind. And that it's, it's one of those linchpin social determinants of health where, you know, without stable housing, it's very difficult to do a lot of other things. So okay. thinking more through that is kind of what the work has been and really speaking to how can we address questions of policy? How can we address questions of clinical care as well? You know, at all the different levels that we know people, people don't exist in, in sort of these like vacuums. They, they exist sort of within families, within communities, within cities. And so, you know, when we're trying to, to sort of treat the issue of housing instability, it really requires efforts at, at all these levels. It's so complicated, and I, I wonder if you said this wasn't what you did initially. What did you think the work would be, and what has surprised you about what the work actually is? I, I, I missed the beginning of that question. Say well, that. I'm, I'm just curious. So, so you came into this as an epidemiologist looking at chronic disease, right. looking at vulnerable communities. Right. You now do all these different things. You work in diabetes. What, is, what has surprised you the most about what you're finding doing the actual work day to day? Well, I will say that the biggest, the biggest issue that I find is that we are in these kind of like echo chambers when it comes to understanding these problems, which means that I don't, it's important for me to have conversations outside of this discipline to understand all of these different levels. And so the siloed, the siloedness, I think, of, of how we understand health um, was, was not serving me well. So trying to think more about how is it that we can think about issues around, um, you know, advocacy, issues around policy, issues around how people sort of um, think about the whole issue of housing and health has been important to just my evolution and understanding how to think through the questions that are important to ask. So that's been the biggest sort of um, Surprising, I guess surprising in a way that, you know what, I don't have all the answers in here. We need to sort of collaborate across disciplines to think through how these can be, how, how these different issues can be addressed. I think that we're, we're in agreement about that. And I want to bring Sam back in. Sam, can we get you to join us? I think this is a great moment to bring you back into the conversation. Okay. Uh, what you are both seeing that the complexity of these problems, the fact that this is a nationwide global issue, and you both have had experience. I'd like to actually ask you this, Sam. I, I was reading about the work. You've been all over the world looking at this problem. What did yes. you learn? You talked about Finland. You talked about Scandinavia. What, what other parts of the world did you see where there were cultural issues, economic issues, and I think particularly for this audience tonight, perhaps design issues, solutions, or, or impediments to those solutions that made you think about it in a different way? Well, this is what I've learned. I've learned that, um, well, homelessness, when we say across the world, I've, I've only been through the Northern Hemisphere mostly. I've been to Argentina a little bit, but countries in the Southern Hemisphere have so many people in different forms of homelessness, like, like in Brazil and Argentina, like when I was in Buenos Aires, they had 110,000 people living in shanty towns. And it's like, what about those people? It's like, no, no, those people are living in shanty towns. They're not homeless. You know, they were like these cinder blocks. So the definition of homelessness, um, the countries that even define homelessness as a problem have de facto committed to doing something about it because they've defined a public or a social problem, right? So that's not everybody, that's sort of more the Western. The system of care I've described, which is uh, an institutionally based system of care primarily, I'm talking about shelter, clean and sober, transitional housing and housing eventually, even though there's been, as far as I know, no international conference 
Everyone across the world has designed the same kind of system, dates back to 200 years. The idea that people with severe mental illness need supervised living and that they're not capable. This is a myth that has, you know, if, if people saw the uh, earlier panel on, uh, on hospital, you understand that there's a whole other movement of recovery and people living in the community, like everybody else, very strong, but doesn't have the same, uh, I would say, voice as the traditional medical model system, the psychopharmacological system. You know, there's like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a battle for the business. <laughs> and um, so there are people that have these kinds of systems everywhere and the group that doesn't do well this is the group that i have found everywhere is a group that doesn't can't climb up the stairs and no one knew what to do with them so one of the reasons that they wanted to bring in something different that they recognized that repeating the same thing with this group uh, wouldn't work so they were desperate to try something else and that's why they brought in housing first so housing first does two things. It sort of challenges our thinking that people need institution and supervised care. And it also challenges the idea that just because someone uh, may be hearing voices doesn't mean they can't cook a nice pasta. You know, it's like <laughs> they, a beautiful they're, image. they're not the same thing. You know, people can be struggling with emotional, you know, anxiety, this, but they, they can still manage the day to day life uh, that they need. Do you do so, you know the story of Agnes's jacket? No. Do either of you know the story of Agnes's jacket? Um, can I ask Jen or Kate to Google Agnes's jacket, find a picture of the jacket, and put a link in the chat for all of our listeners? This is a wonderful uh, uh, psychologist who I think teaches at Wesleyan, who did a study on a woman who had been a seamstress at the end of the 19th century, and she was in some German-speaking country. I, I may have been Vienna. And she was hearing voices and she was an un uneducated woman and she was right. terrified to tell anybody that she was hearing voices. So yes. she sewed language into her jacket. Oh. And for people, there it is. For oh, designers, beautiful. this is the most exquisite artifact yes. that is redolent with what she could not contend with, which yes. was how to translate the affliction of hearing voices. And so she sewed the, it's the most beautiful thing in the book, which yes. is called Agnes's Jacket is, I, I'm, it's not my world, but yeah. I highly recommend it. I thought it was such a beautiful thing to be yeah. able to see visually. Thank you, um, yeah. my friends, yeah. for sharing that. Yeah. Um, uh, no, back is, to you. Okay. So. No, no, that's uh, that's that's beautiful, and that's. I mean, I think we, 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 living with mental illness is what recovery is about. You know, when we start having the early flip phones, instead of having people be yelling and screaming into the air, we told them just take out your phone and just talk on the phone. You know, you, you won't get stopped by the police or the ambulances and be, be carted away, you know, <laughs> like, like, just right. like fu functionality, functionality. And the other thing architecturally about why is it important, you know, Earl said several times about healing is about family and community, you know, and we have too much of an individualized approach here, medicine and treatment. But... But the things that cause trauma are interpersonal or intersocial. The things that cause poverty are social. The solutions also need to be social. They're not individual solutions for socially caused problems. And we, the same percentages that we use in the conversation about homelessness and why we have done so miserably to solve homelessness in this country are exactly the same factors that are making us do a terrible job with COVID. We have an individualized culture. We have no national and local coherent plan. The federal government is off on their own broom. The state governments vary depending on what it is that you know, is going on politically. And the local governments, you have mayors that are fighting with governors because of the different parties. People are getting terrible information about the severity of, of COVID-19 and what to do about it. And our numbers are showing that because we don't have a plan, you know. And it's and it's terribly incoherent. I, uh, Earl, would you like to comment on this? I, I'd love to hear your your take on on how this work you're doing uh, is particularly uh, difficult at this time when 
I mean, everything is difficult at this time for everybody, but perhaps you could talk to us about this. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, Sam has, has sort of outlined this perfectly. It's just, I mean, we're seeing with COVID right now um, with just the, the, um, the different sort of racial disparities with death from COVID are highlighting our issues around, um, you know, how poorly we address these kinds of health conditions and concerns for our population. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where it, it, it's, it's kind of like, okay, well, here, here it is again. We're, we're, we're not sort of like really addressing the issues and addressing these problems of, um, of, uh, of really just like um, dealing with how we manage our sort of like um, our health, our, not just health, but our social and, and economic conditions in the United States. So I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think COVID is a, is a great example of this and housing is right front and center of all of that. So it's very, it's sort of illuminating all of these issues. And, and, and really it's, it's, it's kind of, are we gonna learn now our lesson and try to move forward with this? Or are we gonna continue to, to just ignore? And then when the next thing comes, it's the same thing again. It's this same yeah, pattern yeah. of, uh, of and, and we just keep doing the same thing over again. And I think you're right, there's no, coherent plan to address it um and it's just um it it uh it's very upsetting to try to think about you know yeah. because we know we, we we know what we should be doing it's just yes it's that's right the hard part you, you know w w one of the strange things for me because i've been like trying to persuade governments agencies like no don't put people in shelters or congregate settings they want a place of their own it's dignified it's important you know and and people living in programs, uh, you know, are, are not living in the community. They're not surrounded by family or community. Yeah. Before you mentioned about uh, Agnes's jacket, I was going to tell you uh, about this woman, Mary, because one of the programs that asked me to visit was a uh, 30 apartments. You know, when I mean apartments, they were like tiny studios, you know, and, and, and I hope architects will understand that it shouldn't be the design should not be based only on the money available. You got to think about the quality of life. Like just because someone has 110 square feet and there's no common public areas, you know, if you're going to build a, a building with people with mental illness, you've got to have lounges, meeting rooms, you know, places where people can gather. Otherwise, they only have long corridors and 110 square feet. Anyway, you know, I'm not sure why they invited me. And I was telling them about living in the community is completely different than living in a program. And at the end of the presentation, one of the caseworkers says, I think I know what you mean, because one of our residents graduated, this woman, Mary, she lives now in a regular apartment building just two blocks from here. And I ran into her on the street and I said, Mary, you know, it's so great to see you. You're looking great. You know, you're all like dressed up. And she says, yeah, you know, I live in this uh, like apartment building now. I have to go to Target and get a new dress because you can't just walk around like you live in a program like I used to. And, you know, to me, the other people in the apartment building are the treatment. We don't know them. We don't pay them. They're not part of our program, but they are just the world. They're like, like our neighbors, just like we have neighbors. And it, it has a different kind of a press on the person's adaptation to what life is about when you have normalized relationships with people. That's why I think this, you know, the, the design of an, a place of your own, a lease of your own, the dignity of being a tenant, not a member of a program, mm -hmm. has a whole other feel to it. You're not moving into housing, you're moving into your own place. You decorate it, you put stuff up on the wall. You, you pick the, the you know, little furniture that's yours, but you're making a home. You're not moving into housing. That is healing. You're nodding, Earl. I think you agree with this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think he's, that that's sort of resonates with, you know, with, with me in many ways. And, 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 also in, and also understanding, I mentioned this before, but just sort of how we need to really collaborate across disciplines to understand how those how do those housing sort of, you know, how does how do those that those built structures fit within these neighborhoods and connect people to resources and community, and you know, and so that that's all. And then you know, how do we really think more about, um, you know, how to really connect people in the ways that Sam were talking about? So I, I think it's very important that that's that's good. 
Uh, we're going to go, I think, to some of these audience questions, which I, I, uh, I think that we actually, we've got a uh, first question from Bridget. Uh, and uh, do we want to unmute Bridget and let Bridget ask her question? Can we do that? I can, but I don't have a voice today, so you Oh, might... you, sound, you sound very yeah. sexy, Bridget. <laughs> which, which, which question would you like to ask, Bridget? Uh, the first one would be uh, great. So this is about uh, individualistic culture? Yes. He's yes, okay. That, so Bridget, but, yeah. would, would you like to ask it, or would you like me to ask it for you? I guess I'll ask it. Okay. Uh, Bridget asks, uh, she says that the U.S. culture is very individualistic, and when you put vulnerable people in housing mixed with those more financially and emotionally stable. She's asking if the community reaches out to those who are vulnerable, or do they shun them? It's an interesting question. How much does being in a welcoming community assist mental health and healing? And how do you sort of manage that? Or who manages that? Yeah. Either one of you. Carol, do you want to go? You want me to start? Uh, it, I, it varies uh, by building, by apartment. Uh, I would say overall, We've, we, we have not had problems that people who are mentally ill are generally um, withdrawn uh, a little on the shy side and uh, tend to be you know, vulnerable. And I think when they're encountered by other neighbors, there's a kind of an embracing or you know, a kind of a, a welcoming uh, that way. Um, I don't know that all of the neighbors know that the person who moved in next door has a, a problem at all, you know, because it's like when, once you move in and, and you've taken a shower and you've rested, you're like every other tenant in the building, you know, so <laughs> it's not it's not like, uh, you know, someone's wearing a tag and says I'm part of this program. It's just regular housing. There are there are neighbor issues. I mean, sometimes people are yelling at, at no one in particular at the walls. Sometimes they have people over because they're lonely and they haven't made new friends from their homeless friends. So their homeless friends are coming over because that's who they had before. So it's not people move in and live happily ever after. But I think uh, we anticipate, we hope for the best, but we're prepared to negotiate with neighbors, explain to the tenant what, what the neighbor's position is. We're very active working with landlords or building managers or neighbors to make this thing a success. You know, we, we all want it to be successful, but it is one of the variables that we don't control. You know, we don't, we put someone in 4B, we don't know who's in 4A or 4C. It really does, do speak, <laughs> it does speak to this question of policy, education, social services, and education for those tenants, education for yeah. us all. Yes, did yes. you find uh, that we're, we're in these countries where you've seen these very successful models, Sam, did you find that, that there was education for the populace at large? Well, embedded in that question is this assumption that like it's the pr people who are very poor and homeless and then everyone else is doing extremely well. I think that's a bit, that's not really the way real estate works. <laughs> it's like the people who are doing really well. I'm ready to move to Finland. Just based on your based on your recommendation. I don't blame you. <laughs> Except it's cold for a lot of the it's time. Very right? cold. It's a different story. Take up hockey, you know. <laughs> but uh, but they there is um, you're renting in the low end of the real estate market because you know these apartments we're renting are Section Eight public housing uh, type of uh, fair market value, so that there isn't as much of a cultural socioeconomic difference between the tenants and that. It's not like, in fact, if you happen to find an, you can't afford apartments in the high end buildings. So that there's a kind of, a, there's a kind of a community feel to the buildings that the tenants that you're housing don't stand out in some uh, stark way. You know, uh, I, I, I think that, in Finland, they already know this building is a mixed income building. So the tenants that are renting are aware that there's gonna be a mix of tenants. Uh, so it, it, it's public awareness to begin with. You're choosing to live there supporting the model rather than being surprised that someone has moved in that isn't of your same class, let's say. We have a question from Trudy Watt. I wonder if we can unmute Trudy. And I think this question might wanna to go to Earl. Hi, Trudy. Hi. Um, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Um, really appreciate it. Um, my question, I guess, is about the 
power and prestige of medicine as problematic as it is. Um, and the way that architects, speaking as an architect and educator, are not seen as a part of, or, or major contributors to the sort of ecology of the social determinants of health. So I'm wondering, you know, what, how can architects be seen to be competent and meaningful within the conversation about care? And I wonder if either of you have had experiences where you're starting to see design as care sort of legible in your own work. That's a great question. I, I think, question. and it, again, it gets to just, you know, what I've been saying about just really getting out of these, um, these silos. And you're right. I mean, there's, there's, I'll say this much, the, the current, the current, um, I guess the way we're starting to think about or moving towards these social terms of health, it's that, you know, our individualist sort of like model is not serving us very well. So we need to think more about how, you know, other, these other areas, other disciplines can help inform how we address health in general. So I think you're right, creating um, places or spaces for that kind of integration between different um, uh, disciplines can happen and um, trying to think more about problems and health in that kind of more holistic way. And I think, I mean, Mindy had talked about this, Mindy fully love in, in our plenary, she talked about kind of, I think it was like the ecology of things, right? So understanding across the different sort of like disciplines, how to, how to think about these problems a little bit more. So I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a growing recognition that it's important to address these kinds of issues of, um, of these sort of social and economic issues as it relates to health. And I think, you know, we're moving, moving that direction, probably not as fast as we would like, and probably not as fast as we should. But I think, I think we are sort of moving slowly in that direction. So, so you know, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. But I think, I think overall, we are at least coming to terms with the fact that we need to think this, we need to think about this differently. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, you know, what I, what I think about that. If I may, can I, I, I'd like to yes, just please. address uh, this idea too, because I think it's huge, uh, the question about the integration of the thinking of architects. And I think for, for me, it starts with vision. It's like, what do we imagine the right type of place is for people? You know, and what is the right place for people with mental illness in our culture? Are they over there or are they with us? And, and if they're with us, what does all of that look like? So it, it, it starts with, with a shared vision. I think that the, um, you know, some of the, there is so much room for creativity and innovation in architecture if you have a vision of normalized housing as opposed to building quasi-institutional spaces. You know, yesterday I watched uh, the, uh, or the day before, I, you know, it's COVID, I don't know what day it is to tell you the truth, but uh, I watched the mental health one on the hospital and they showed inside shots of the Soteria house. I don't know if any of you saw that. This beautiful home for people with mental illness to go and chill instead of going to a psychiatric emergency room, just like a place where you're comforted. You know, you have your own bedroom and there are people there and you already have a plan of how you want to be treated when you're not doing well. You know, the last thing you want is an emergency room. They're toxic. They're scary places often. I went to uh, a healthcare for the homeless program in Denver, Colorado. It was the um, Denver the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. And I, I had to meet the executive director at their healthcare clinic, which used to be in a warehouse. I go into this building, their new healthcare clinic, glass and wood, light wood, brown, light brown leather, soft green colors on the wall, a receptionist that meets you immediately. I'm like, do I have the right address? This is like a rich people's clinic. You know, it was beautiful. And there was like so much space in the waiting room. And it's like, it felt so calm to be there. It was, a, it was, it was fantastic. And, and so when, when John Parvensky shows up, I said, John, like this place is, because you know, we worked with, we worked with trauma informed architecture, he says. It's like, we knew the people coming in here are homeless and desperate and anxious. We wanted to create a space to have everyone calm down while they're waiting to see their dentists or their doctors. And, and, and the power of that space is beautiful. They're not the only ones that do this. You can design 
beautiful clinics for not that much more money. So it feels like a rich people's place for poor people. And then suddenly, <laughs> you know, like the feel of the service is one thing, but the dignity of just having the same, the same services, not that much difference in money, but just allowing yourself to think that why not, why not make it beautiful? I think this, this, you're asking a very interesting question. This idea of, of trauma-informed design, experience design, thinking about every step along at a very granular level, every step along the way, also makes me think, and it was a little bit in the, I think it was Trudy's question, someone's question. And we're gonna go to Nicole next, if you can unmute yourself, Nicole. This idea of interrogating your assumptions, right? You interrogate your assumptions, the vocabulary changes, the way you ask questions changes. And what you see on the other end changes. And I really think it's an interesting thing in a conversation like this that is so cross-disciplinary that that's really a wonderful thing that comes out of it. That you know, physicians talking to architects, we will start to actually use different words to describe the same problems and maybe come up with new solutions. And, and Nicole, where are you? And the community. And the community, exactly, the, as you right. both have said. The, the voices, right. yeah. Right, those voices, more voices. <laughs> Nicole. Hi. Uh, I said, do you see the U.S. becoming like other countries that have housing as a right? As it, if so, how many years from now? And what can architects do to continue contribute to this goal? Wow, you can hold it. The first two are really tough. I mean, <laughs> you really want to talk about that? Uh, I mean, um, you know, we're going in the opposite direction. Our our income disparity over since. The 1980s, since neoliberalism really set in with Reagan, but has continued through Democratic and Republican administrations. You know, Clinton did away with welfare. It's like we are we are big time into capitalism like never before. And with this administration, it's on steroids like it's never been shamelessly, shamelessly. So are we going to turn around? Well, I'm hoping every election that the revolution is coming. I'm hoping the revolution is coming. But there's one takeaway, which is, you know, I started this nonprofit and brought one person at a time into an apartment of their own. And now this program is like all over the world. So you can, with every single building, with every single project, change the world a little bit, you know, and the movement then just grows. I think that, you know, we can hope that the cultural, larger cultural issues will shift, of course, and we'll all continue to fight that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's person by person, project by project, I think. I agree. I think, I think you're right. I mean, at, at the national level, it's, it's hard to figure out you know, what's going on, particularly in this climate right now. Um, but you're right. I mean, you, you, you work in the spaces where you are, and you try to do you know, what you think is important around this issue. And then you hope to leverage that platform to get others involved. That's kind of the... That's the way. So you identify what you can in your space, and then you connect others through the work that you're doing, so you can bring in more voices, and then you kind of, and then you sort of move it, move it up. You know, that's kind of been the been the strategy up to now, until we get a more unified federal response to just the issue of housing and security in general. Right. <clears throat> right. Which a unified response about anything is not coming anytime soon, sadly. Uh, maybe maybe by election day. Maybe by election day, twenty forty five. Uh, we're going to take another question from the other Nicole, Nicole Reinders. Renders. Uh, while we're waiting for, thank you, Nicole. I just want to ask you quickly, Earl, these questions of difficulty in getting a response, in getting a coordinated response, in getting a coherent response, also must be difficult in terms of community response at a moment when the pandemic makes it so difficult to reach people in the community? Are you finding that uh, families are, are grouping together so you can reach them in different ways? Is it actually harder because everybody's so, in a sense, disconnected, even within communities? I mean, it, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what's happening during, during sort of a pandemic at this point. So it's kind of, yes, we, we had issues with just, um, you know, housing arrangements, household crowding, those kinds of things. But then, you know, you add on top of that a level of just, you know, pandemic and then everything is really sort of in the air, it becomes like, it becomes sort of this very sort of chaotic space to try to figure out what's going on, how to prioritize what. Um, I think, you know, in moving forward, I think what we need to, to have a, it, it's, like I said, it's going to be, we're going to have issues like this happening. I mean, we have, 
you know, we have severe storms, we have wildfires, we have more of these sort of like, you know, natural disasters and climate change issues that are happening. We need to really start to have a larger plan around how we're going to manage these, these kinds of issues around housing when these kinds of things are coming around. So it, it's very difficult to sort of connect at this time, you know, when we're dealing with this sort of overall kind of like issues around the pandemic. Impossible. Nicole, over to you. Yeah, so really building off of what you just said, um, as we said earlier in the beginning of the presentation or about this conversation, we talked about like we know the solution to the problem, yet we have to build it at a national scale, which right now seems impossible. But what do you two both think is the first step into making the solution appear on the national agenda? Well, um, two, two things. One is that there has been, uh, in almost the last uh, 10 years in this country, one major initiative around housing first, and it had to do with veterans experiencing homelessness. Somewhere around 2009, 2010, about 10 years ago, uh, there was a lot of publicity during the Obama administration about the fact, you know, uh, we have this thing uh, called the, the one night count in the homelessness business, which is the third January, the third Thursday in January, we go out and we count everybody who's homeless in the country. That's how we have our national estimate. It's about five, 565,000 now. It's been that way for quite some time. But they identified 70,000 among those that were veterans, veterans coming, you know, some of them have served overseas, they've been out there five years, three years, 10 years, different tours. But that created a congressional uh, sense of shame and, and I think also responsibility. And they voted in 70,000 housing vouchers and money for case management and treatment services. So HUD provided the vouchers, the housing and urban development, and then the VA provided the case management. And city after city, we have now approximately 60 cities that are, uh, have ended veterans homelessness. So, you know, even in this country where there's so much disagreement, that initiative has remained and has shown remarkable success. Where we are actually today, there's uh, something called the United States Interagency Council on the Homeless. Uh, and the Trump administration appointed a guy named Robert Marbutt in January who came strongly uh, against housing first, wanted to go back to housing fourth because he didn't think root causes were income disparity or racism or redlining or any of these things. He thought these people are just drug addicts and they're uh, alcoholics and they need to go to a shelter and they need to get clean and sober and then give them housing. Housing fourth he was advocating for. The strange pandemic came and completely uh, annihilated his argument because in this pandemic, Everybody, you know, there's, I'm in California right now. They just allocated 15,000 hotel motel rooms. Everyone is out of shelter, off the streets and getting into a place of their own. We've been begging and advocating for this for years, but the, the, the virus achieved in a month what we haven't been able to achieve in all that time because they recognize congregate living and shelter living is unhealthy, right? So. Um, but we're not in a good place at a, at a, at a federal level, as, as you might guess. But, uh, but that's not to say that we don't have the capacity to change courses very quickly. Like the Veterans Initiative was extraordinary, you know, for, for, uh, for, for its magnitude and its success and its, and its alignment of um, political uh, kind of um, agreement. Reasons to be hopeful. We need some. Uh, thank you, Sam. Jackson, Lindsay, we're going over to you now. Where are you, Jackson? Hi, uh, thank you so much for this great conversation. Um, my question was, uh, in a country that has turned its back on public housing and seems to want no responsibility in housing its most vulnerable, and uh, Sam, like you said, I mean, going back decades, that's not just the past four years, but what are some models that we as citizens can engage in that don't fully rely on the private market, which also doesn't seem interested in helping at a wide scale? 
right? Because if the private market had figured out how to solve homelessness, we would have figured it out a long time ago. But uh, all of the countries that do well in public housing are countries where either the government is invested in public housing or uh, nonprofits are operating the rental market. So there are controls in terms of the rate of rent increases and they're, they're managed so that any profit is reinvested in the real estate portfolio. I, I think that you know, we, have, we have a lot of nonprofits in this country, uh, which most countries that have very poor government infrastructure or safety nets end up creating a lot of nonprofits as a substitute, nowhere near scale. But I think that that's, that's where we are. We'd have to work on individual projects or national projects uh, statewide projects, uh, almost like a grassroots movement in advocacy, expanding the conversation out of homelessness into affordable housing is hugely important because we're just talking about a tiny group of people when we talk about people who are homeless. Talking about affordable housing creates a constituency that is many times larger. The conversation belongs in income disparity and lack of affordable housing because that's what's going to have the constituency and build the momentum to actually make political change. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, and I don't even, I mean, you mentioned just the veterans sort of um, <clears throat> program and, and it, it's a federal investment. I mean, that's, that's what it, that's what it takes. And so, and maybe, who knows, maybe the, um, maybe the, the pandemic is a, is a wake up call to, you know, I can only hope that, that it's sort of a, you know, a, a, a wake up call to the, to the country yeah. and that it, it really affects us all. I mean, it's not something that you can isolate to certain populations and then forget about it. This issue of housing security and, and, um, and having that kind of security is something that affects everybody. So we really need to sort of think about how we can really address this issue. And I really, I mean, I don't, I don't know how we do, how we do it without some sort of federal investment, to be honest. You know, Earl, as you were speaking, I was thinking there's a beautiful line in a poem by Langston Hughes where he says, to kill the lies of color that keep the rich enthroned, which is as beautiful a description of redlining as I've ever heard. Of course, he wrote it many, many years ago. But I wonder if, to come back to that question for one second before we move to the next, uh, next one, uh, if you think that there are specific things in, in your constituency, in your community, working with black and brown people, at this moment, are you, are, I just have to ask, for me, it's the elephant in the room. Are you, are, do you think that people are hearing it in a different way now? Are they, are, are it's, is it possible that policymakers and change agents will pay attention to this because of what's gone on this summer since, the, since these protests and since the death of George Floyd? I think, I think there is a, this is a moment because we're having so many of these things happening at the same time, it seems to me like there may be a, um, a, a final like turning point in really addressing these kinds of issues. I mean, on, you know, when you think about just, you know, how much we have to sort of address this issue of racism in our country to really have a better, um, you know, handle on, on you know, the, the, the unfair or unjust burden of, of poor or poor health on our communities of color, I think we need to think about those kind of things a little bit more. And this pandemic is giving us, giving us kind of, it's, it's exposing everything. So we have to think through all, and, and the issues are not just affecting those populations. So you have, you know, it's, it's causing a kind of like a rippling throughout the entire sort of our, our, our entire country. So it, it, it really does not serve any of us to leave anyone out. So I think, you know, we're starting to have these conversations more and more now and the complexity and that sort of the compounding of these different social conditions on top of one another. When you deal with like a pandemic on top of like these issues around, um, you know, mass incarceration and then you have issues around you know, climate change and then everything is sort of is, is compounded together now. So we mm -hmm. really need to think about this um, and, and, and really dive, sort of divert resources to really addressing it. And, you know, New York City is sort of, this is where I live, you know, we have, um, we have a lot of housing protections as far as cities go, but it's still, you know, there's still so many people in need that, you know, we, we really have to, it, it's the scale that we need to get everyone in a place where they have safe and affordable housing is, is enormous. 
Um, and so we really need to sort of think about as a country whether or not we consider that to be unacceptable or not. So, <laughs> so I, don't know. I, I don't know that we have. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it, it, very well said. Uh, Ruby, you have a question for Earl. Unmute Ruby. You know, while we're waiting for Ruby, can I say this about the pandemic? And I, yes. Earl, I, I love your um, momentum building because, you know, we're talking about from homelessness to affordable housing, but it's also climate change, structural racism, incarceration. That's, that's, the, that's the bigger movement. That's the bigger movement. And I, I don't know what you guys think about this, but I had the impression that there was a sort of a strange um, moment of consciousness raising because of the pandemic because we all saw the video of George Floyd being murdered. Because if the kids were in school, or if we were working as usual, some of us would have seen it, but we were all home. We were all like in that early phase, we're doing nothing but watching screens. We all saw that. And I think, strangely, we were all on the same page about it. I think it contributed to the uh, mass reaction because, because we'd all been there. And we all had uh, the focus, you know. And, and we all have this. Yeah. We this were all is on another this. thing. It's an incredibly powerful tool for yes, community, yes, for community could, advocacy, engagement, and, yes. and to really make interventions in, in real time. In, in real, real time. time. Look, look what, I mean, I think, I, I think that's what happened in part why we had such an amazing movement there. You yeah. know, we, we were all watching it. Yeah, yeah that's a very good point. Uh, Ruby is not responsible. Bonding. So I'm going to read her question. Uh, she's asking, what do we, can we learn from these times of lockdown about home as private non-public space and the relationship this has with isolation, loneliness, and mental health? Wonderful question. How can we design homes that are safe and well adapted for those experiencing mental illness while still supporting an integration into potentially triggering or unsafe societal spaces that have potentially caused maladaptive mental illness behaviors? Gentlemen? Wow. Well, you know, that's a, that's a very well worded challenge, uh, certainly to the model of scattered site integrated housing. Well, we've touched on it in different ways about what about the neighbors and all of that. It's true. We're in an area in community integration where it's not safe space. It's not controlled space. It's like real space, you know, with all of the pluses and minuses of that. And that's a very delicate question because you don't want to err on the side of over protecting people. So where I go to that is like, where is the line? I don't know the line. To me, the line is where the person I'm working with says the line is. It's their line that we're dealing with. It's not up to us to figure out what is safe or what is comfortable for them and design that. We work with them you can have this option, which is a much safer space. There's eight people, it's a group home and you're supervised, would you feel safe there? Or do you want your own place in the community and you know, live in an independent apartment with visiting? The loneliness is in part architectural in one model as opposed to the other, but it's mostly emotional. People with mental illness have a hard time connecting. You have to work to help people uh, make those connections. It doesn't come naturally. I, I'd like Earl, I'd like you to answer this question too, but I want to put a little spin on it, which is that I think her, her question, the way she framed this, makes the question of loneliness not just an issue for the mentally ill, which is not to minimize the complexity of the work you're doing reaching the mentally ill and how individual this work is. But I'm thinking about Vivek Murthy, Dr. Vivek Murthy's book. This is, for those of you who don't know, was the Surgeon General, I believe, under Obama, who's just come out with a book on loneliness. Do you think, Earl, work in your work as an epidemiologist, that by making the conversation about being lonely, which is something we've all experienced since March, part of the national dialogue, does it normalize something that might be an isolation? I mean, that, to come back to Agnes's jacket, right? Like, we're all alone confused. Do you think that there's some benefit in opening up the dialogue around questions of mental illness that normalize it in ways that can make it easier to talk about? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I guess the way that I think about that question is, um, 
you know, in the situation we find ourselves now, where we are connecting through a number of different ways, usually through this kind of like devices and things like that, it's, it's sort of uncharted territory at this point. I mean, we kind of connect digitally in a number of different ways, and I don't see that going away. So for me, it's, it's about trying to understand how do we connect and build relationships within this kind of a space and thinking about, you know, are there issues around, you know, so, so that's sort of one part of it. And then I think the question sort of around design or design elements is one that that's, that's the conversation. It's like, how do we think about space and what are we designing it for? And so if you think about um, issues of social isolation and loneliness, those kinds of things, those are, they have, those have health consequences. I mean, you're, you're, you're really dealing with issues around isolation. So, so, you know, but I, I, I tend to think, and this is just like my opinion, that maybe this kind of digital space also allows us to maybe expand these social networks in ways that we just haven't really thought about before. I mean, it, to me, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a opportunity to really think about how we can you know, use our sort of technology and digital platforms to try to like build communities in these kinds of spaces too. Um, you know, so so it, it allows us to connect in a lot of different a lot of different ways. Um, that's, a, that's a really. What do you think, Sam? That's. A, I mean, it's a, it's a very hopeful, optimistic view of ways of actually collaborating and coming together around sort of shared mission. Yes. No, from I, different I, disciplines. Well, I think the instead of pathologizing loneliness and making it uh, a community problem or uh, you know, a, a problem of citizenship, I think is always a, a step in the right direction of normalizing the, the struggle. Absolutely. Also, you know, it's like we're all a little bit mentally ill, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like that. It's, it's not such a big stigma, you know, it, uh, it kind of uh, opens up a conversation of like, we're all more the same than different. Are you finding that it's less of a stigma than it was years ago? Uh, the, you know, it varies. Depends who you're talking to. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so yeah. you're talking but, to a bunch but of overall, architects. But, but overall, overall, yes. Overall, you're talking yes. to a bunch of architects, and I, we have five minutes left, and I'd like to actually, we have so many excellent questions here, and I hope that there's a way that we can share these with our panelists and put everyone in touch with everyone, because I know we could, I could listen to you two filibuster forever. Uh, but I'd like to ask you, you've got a bunch of architects, what, what are your questions for them? What, what, what do you think architects need to be thinking about? What questions should they be asking? What work should they be doing to answer the question of housing, home, mental illness, the future of a lack of policy, lack of coherence in our nation's government? What would you say? Um, Earl, let's go to you first. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the challenge, at least the one that I can think of now is that since we're in this kind of mental health um, equity space is what, what, how do we design for health equity? Um, you know, what, what does that look like if we are trying to um, design in a way that allows access for all and all voices are represented in those kinds of spaces, then, you know, what does that, what does that look like? I mean, I, I think for me, it's about who are the voices that are at the table when it comes to designing, as well as what are the communities that we're designing for. And and, and, and thinking about, you know, you know what, is the, what is the overall plan for thinking through those kinds of design elements? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a challenge in a way to kind of think through not just issues of whether there should be housing or not housing, but also, but thinking also around, you know, how do we, how do we reduce the disparities in who gets access to this kind of housing? So that's the kind of like, um, overarching challenge and, and, and you know, what's the role of the architect in that space? How do we think about it? What is, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the, the way I would, I would frame that. We need you to come to Yale and teach a course on design for equity. I'll be your TA. <laughs> Sam? Right. Um, I don't have really a lot to add to that. I mean, I think what I've learned is, and maybe this is useful, but to follow up on Earl's point, if you're designing housing that's healthy and equitable, one of the problems that I have encountered over and over again, especially in the mental health field or homelessness field, people who are mentally ill or poor, you have somehow a confound 
but you need to design some kind of special housing for the poor, for the mentally ill. And in fact, that takes away from the kind of design that we're talking about where everybody, actually all of us, need the same quality housing if we're going to have a healthy home and a healthy community. So don't be distracted by a specific uh, characteristic of the population you're designing for. Design with quality in mind, excellence in mind, whoever it is, because that's what we all need. I can't think of a more beautiful place to end. I also have to say, there's something so marvelous that someone as accomplished as you are, Sam, say, starting a sentence with the thing I have learned, right? I think in, implicit in this conversation, and, and I'm gonna now invoke the leadership voice of our friend Alison Cunningham, is, is I think being humble and trading a little bit of, of the sort of hubris that unfortunately is endemic in our world today with a kind of curiosity and understanding and compassion. And I can't thank you both enough for joining me tonight. This has been so marvelous. We've got one minute, le minute left. I'd like to bring back Jen and Kate to wave to everybody. While I remind those of you who are going to come to the rest of these marvelous events that the next event is the Architectures of Mental Health panel on Tuesday, September 22nd at one o'clock. Thank you everybody for joining me. This has been just a marvelous, uh, really provocative, stimulating evening and um, thank you. Jessica, thank you. Thanks. Take care. Earl, great to see you. Good to see you thank too. you, Kate. Bye, Jen. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending.